and welcome back to On Your Terms. I'm your host, Sam Vanderbilen. I'm an attorney turned entrepreneur who helps online coaches, course creators, educators legally protect and grow their online businesses using my DIY legal templates and my best selling ultimate bundle. So thank you so much for being here this week. I am so excited to chat with you today about what I've learned from contractor and employee breakups in my company um, because there are so many great lessons about hiring, firing, building teams, like everything in between. And so I'm hoping that you're able to take some of what I've learned so far and apply it to your own business. Now, because this is a May episode, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that every single episode in May is kicking off with a quick tip from my dad, Norm, my Norm tip um, of the episode. And they are not crazy like novel tips. They are just tips. (laughs) Norm was a simple guy, so you can't expect much more than that. Um, But this week's Norm tip for you was that Norm said that you always had to have canned veggies on hand in case of a power outage. And he really thought it was important to have something with protein. So he would always have like cans of beans and he would like make this like five bean salad with like kidney beans and garbanzo beans and like and green beans and all this stuff. But he also had like canned veggies and he loved beets. He loved pickled beets. So he'd also have like pickled things. Um, it was just really funny, but he was like always preparing for like some terrible hurricane or something to come or some terrible snowstorm. He hated the cold. So he was like, you have to have canned veggies. So when he would come to my house, he would literally investigate like the pantry and be like, you don't have enough canned veggies to make it through a storm. And I was like, well, we're going to be all right. (laughs) So, (laughs) so I have enough, um, canned coconut milk to last like a really, really long time. So there's something in that healthy fat. Okay, cool. So with that, thank you for indulging my norm tip of the week. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm really excited to chat with you today about what I've learned from contractor and employee breakups because I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and I think when when it comes to hiring, managing a team, being, being more of like a leader in your online business, we're sort of flying blind here for, for many different reasons. Like for one, hiring in our industry is really different. Like we hire for different positions than a quote unquote normal company. Um, but I also think like, yeah, even on like our lingo, like well, I remember when I was starting out and I was like, I want to hire a VA. And I would like tell other people, they would be like, what's a VA? Like people didn't even understand what that was. Um, even like these roles themselves, like a VA and OBM, they're relatively new in in like the scheme of hiring or, or like in, um, you know, employment. So it's not like all this stuff is super clear cut and like there's a great simple process out there that you're supposed to follow. We also just don't know what we don't know about hiring. And I think like so many hiring, like whether you're hiring like your first VA, hiring a full-time employee, hiring a new contractor, like there's just a lot to be said for going through the process and learning. The downside is that there are people involved and there's time and there's money when you're the business owner. So it's really hard, but I do feel like like a lot of people just learn by like doing the stuff and getting into it, you know? And I feel like we get like really excited about people helping us. And I'm going to have a really good tip for you in a couple minutes about this, but maybe you even get excited about a specific person that you find. And you're just like, I just want that person to work for me. Or I want that person to be in my business. And we, we don't really have a whole lot of clarity and we make sometimes decisions that just don't end up panning out. And sometimes we, I, a lot of what I see in like the online business world, like I remember like when I started out, it became really popular for people to hire an OBM and it became like a status symbol of like, yeah, I have an OBM. Do you have an OBM? <laughs> like I didn't have anybody who worked for me for a really long time, but I remember thinking I was doing something wrong because I saw other people hiring people and I thought I had to hire somebody similar, right? So I have hired all sorts of people. I have hired contractors. I have hired contractors of all varieties, like people to work on just a project, people to work um, like on a retainer, people who just work like as we need them. Then I've hired full-time employees, like actual full-time employees. Some people it's worked out great with. Some people have left like without any issues just because like they were moving in a different direction or something in their life changed, their business changed. Others, not so much. It's been a mix, right? And I have learned and I take ownership for every single one of them. I don't have a bad feeling about anybody. I just try to learn from it and I try to own my part of it about what could have gone better or could have gone differently. And I also try to see what our team could have done differently. Anybody in a leadership position, like if something went wrong or or just like looking back on it, like, oh, we could have done this a little differently. 
it's it's always a learning lesson. And I hope this goes without saying for anyone who knows me well enough, but like this episode is definitely not about anyone in particular. It's not even about uh, three people in particular. It's like collectively, like I have hired people and and lost contractors for years and years that probably nobody even knows about who have worked, who currently work for me. Like people who work for me don't even know I, I had these contractors. Like they're just I've worked with so many people. So what I really did today was boil down like the most, I don't know, like common issues that I saw amongst all of these people and all of my decisions and my relationships and hiring, not a person. Okay. So I think that goes without saying. So let's go through all of my tips. I have 10 tips for you on what I've learned from contractor and employee breakups that you can implement in your own business. The first one is, they're all so important, but the first one is so important because the first tip is that you need to know what you're looking for. Like in terms of first, I want you to look at the more the legal fit. Okay. So first you have to look at like, am I looking at a f- or for a part-time employee or a full-time employee, like an hourly employee or full-time employee? Am I looking for a contractor? And if I'm looking for a contractor, am I looking for somebody to just complete a project? Like I want to hire a copywriter to write a sales page. That's a contractor in a project role. You hire them for a project. When they're done that project, they're done working for you. You can always rehire them for a new project, but they're not like on tap. Versus, you know, hiring a copywriter on retainer where you pay for, you know, five emails to be written a month and they're writing them every single month for you or uh, 10 hours a month of time or something like that, right? If you want to learn more too about like, are because let me go back because this is important to know. A lot of times people think that they're hiring like that you can think of what kind of like role you want in your business, like you want to hire a VA and you want that person to be a contractor. That's not how it works. So instead, we have to get really, really clear on what you're hiring for. And we'll talk about that more in tip number four. But you need to know about what you're hiring for. And then the position itself dictates whether or not this person is a contractor or an employee. I talk about this in episode 64 of the show of Hiring Contractors 101. I'll link to it in the show notes. But I talk about this because a lot of people get confused about the fact of thinking like that this is a choice, right? So if you want somebody to work for you and you want to control their time, like you want them to work nine to noon and you want them to attend all your meetings and you want them to do like, I don't know, certain things in your business. You're not, you're not like looking at that and defining all the tasks that you want them to do. And then being like, I want this person to be a contractor. Like that person legally is an employee for a number of different reasons that I go into in episode 64 and you don't get a choice in that. So it's more about designing the role and really knowing what you're looking for. Like, am I looking for somebody who I need them to be here all the time? Am I looking for somebody who they can just like have a list of tasks and they can knock out those tasks on their own time? Like my first VA who still works for me, Leanne, she's worked for me for years and years. Um, We give her a whole set of tasks, but she can do these tasks on her time. You know, we're not saying like you have to work from 10 to noon Eastern or whatever. So she has a young child, you know, so sometimes she does this stuff like at different hours so that whatever works for her, right? If she wants to catch up on the weekend, she can catch up on the weekend. If she wants to work at night, she can work at night. Like it's up to her. It's more task oriented. I'm not controlling that kind of stuff. So just at least I want you to like shift your perspective that this is not something that's like a choice necessarily for you that you're like, this is the person I want. I'm going to make them a contractor. It might be that the role itself demands the level of employee or not. So listen to episode 64 if you want to dive deeper into that whole breakdown. Okay, the second tip I have from you, what I've learned from contractor employee breakups is something actually that I learned from Amy Porterfield a long time ago and I want to be better about, which is hiring slow and firing fast. Um, So what Amy's referring to is that a lot of people hire really quickly because they get excited about somebody and then they take way too long usually to fire somebody once it's not working out. And instead, I've heard Amy talk about the fact that, uh, you know, it's actually better to hire slowly and fire quickly, right? Um, And by the way, if you don't know, I just had Amy on the show so uh, last month. So I'll link to our our interview below. But we talked about like being leaders and being, um, having a team and having to manage people and how it's like a whole new ball game. So we did talk about this a little bit in that episode. So I'll link to that below in the show notes. 
The third thing, I think I also learned from Amy. I'm not sure, maybe, or something that somebody said in an episode of hers that I listened to. Honestly, I am I am not sure. So I apologize in advance if I did, but it's just one of those things I feel like I heard I heard this one time and it, it really stuck with me. So my third tip is that you never hire for the person, you hire for the position. This is really, really important because in in online business, especially, I think sometimes we can make like personal relationships with people or be friends with people. And you have somebody who you just really like as a person. And then you're like, I just like want you to be around, right? I want you to work for me. And we'll like find a place to fit you. Like it will stick you somewhere. And that is not a good idea. So we want to instead, if if you like, if you ever feel that way, like we had this recently, and I said this to to Lindsay, my director of operations. I was like, Instead, what we have to do is we have to write out the job description like of what we really need as a company. What tasks do we need fulfilled? What experience does that person need? You know, all that kind of stuff. What qualifications? What like demands do we have? You know, whatever. We write all that out. And then you go back and you look at this person that you're like smitten with and you see objectively as a business person, does that person fit in to the job description that you've written out, Right. Instead of just like liking the person and being like, I'm just going to squeeze you into something and it's going to work out. We're going to hope it works out, right? Not good. This leads to tip number four because tip number four is that you have to be really, really clear on what exactly you want help with in your business and why. So I I went to that uh, retreat in Mexico in March and I was telling the other people at the retreat like how a lot of times people don't think about hiring in terms of like managers and executors or like leadership people and executors. And so it's really helpful for me. The first question I always ask myself is like, am I looking for somebody to execute stuff, right? So, Or am I looking for more strategic visionary? Because in my business, at least, I don't need somebody who's going to come up with a whole bunch of more ideas because I'm good on that. I wake up in the middle of the night. I think of podcast ideas. I'm like, overflowing with subject lines and titles and um, little story quips and blah, blah, blah. It's it's constant, right? It's an affliction. So I don't need a, uh, another idea person. What I do need or what I have liked in the past is somebody who can implement all of my ideas, an executor. So an executor can take my idea and they can write the copy or they can write the email or they can lay out the strategy for a promo that I have the idea for. I then need executors. I need people to set up the landing pages, test the tech, you know, be on the calls to um, answer customers' questions, uh, manage my inbox, manage my marketing schedule, edit my podcast. Like I need executors, right? A lot of times. So it's really important to get clear on that part of like, are you looking for somebody to execute tasks or to manage certain something or strategize certain something? And then within that, like what tasks, right? And so that's where I like to get really clear in tip number five is about, you know, what can I, what kind of tasks do I need to get uh, somebody else to do that I don't need to do? I'm not required. It's not, it doesn't require me. Or it's a task that I'm currently doing that's not moving the business forward, but it needs to get done. Like onboarding new clients, like sending and signing contracts and setting up their portals, responding to customer service emails, tech stuff, taxes, bookkeeping, legal, copywriting for promos. I mean, that moves the business forward, but that's something where it's like, you don't need to do that because somebody else is probably a lot better at it who's trained in conversion copywriting, for example. So there are the you know, web design and maintenance is another one, right? Doesn't move your business forward ultimately. Um, and it's something that somebody else has a high level skill, can get it done much faster. So when you make a list of all the tasks that need to get done, and you're really clear on like, oh, these are all tasks of things that have to be you know, like executed on versus like strategy. Um, and then we're not looking, we're like very clear on the position and we're not hiring for the person, we're hiring for the position. The stuff can start to move a lot smoother. So moving into tip number six, most of the, the rest of the tips are kind of like once somebody is on board and starts working for you in any capacity, these are some of the things that I think come up and, and I can hopefully offer some tips on. So tip number six is to communicate early and often with whoever works for you. I I like the phrase and I've decided to adopt the phrase, feedback is to be expected and it will come early and often. So feedback is not a bad thing. It's all about how it's delivered and it's a skill. It's something that I'm working on. I'm trying to figure out 
how to do it, how to do it best, how to figure out how people like to receive feedback. You have to ask, how do you like to receive feedback? Um, Start having those conversations. But I think this idea of like, at least for me, like waiting and waiting on something that you don't like or that doesn't feel right or it's not sitting right and you wait and wait and you let it build, it never goes well. And this is not just talking about my own business. I'm talking about like so many friends and I worked with like an HR company. I've heard their stories about stuff. It just does not go well if you don't communicate early and often um, about feedback. And, you know, I think one of the things that I learned about too is like having to create a culture of like, yes, you will be complimented and like praised when things are good. Although there's this part of me that's kind of like, I don't know, this like hard ass part of me, I guess that my, my mom was just always like, it's to be expected. Like when you do a good job, like it's a job, you're getting paid like a lot of money and you're like, you're here to do this. Like, I can't thank you every single time. Like it's kind of to be expected. Um, but there, there's also the part of me that's like, no, I want to create a nice environment. And I, I do want to recognize when things are like really exceptional or great, or I just really like something, but I don't want to create the culture that it's like, you're constantly getting like all this positive feedback, but then you're never able to give some, some more constructive feedback too. Um, I also don't want to create the culture that like, if I offer you constructive feedback, I have to pair it with something positive. Um, so it's just, I think it's like a real learning process and it's not something that I'm necessarily good at or anything like that, but I can tell you it's an issue. It's like something that comes up for a lot of people. Um, and I think I'm, I'm liking to think of it these days as reps in a gym, like just the more reps we can get in. It's more just like to be expected. It's not to be personalized. That's like the tone that I'm trying to set on the team. Like this stuff is not personal. You know, a lot of what we do is super subjective. Um, a lot of times when people are trying to find my voice or my style, my design style, it's like, it's all subjective. My way of writing, my way of, of design is not the right way. It's not the best way. It's just the way I like it. Right. And so I'm very honest and upfront about that, but I also can't explain that every single time. Like as the CEO, I just don't have time to do that anymore. And I don't want to do it anymore. I want to own that. Like I've built this business. This business is really, really strong and it's successful. And a lot of why it is like that is because of me executing things this way. And so like, this is how I would like it to be done. If you have a reason where you th- you want to like pitch me a different strategy and you have some stuff to back it up and you want to try it out and you're going to like tell me how you're going to try it out and how we're going to track it and all that kind of stuff, like let me know. But otherwise, this is how this is how I want to do it, you know? So a lot of communication. <laughs> I'll tell you, managing a team really makes you step into your step into yourself, step into your power, which leads to tip number seven, which is like learning how to become a leader and a manager is an entirely new skill that unless you've done it before is really uncomfortable and foreign. I don't think it comes naturally to a lot of people, but when you become a CEO and you want to hire people, whether it's contractors or um, employees, it's now part of your job to be a leader or a manager or both. Everybody, by the way, hits this point in their business when, like, when my business first started to grow, I hired a bunch of contractors. Like, in, like I hired those executors, and when I did, I then felt like I was a manager. I went from being like the CEO of the business and creating all the content to feeling like I was spending my whole day like answering Slack questions and like checking over people's work and then like posting their work for them and like doing little stuff. And on Friday night, when something broke in the funnel, I was on there fixing it myself and always on my phone and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I learned I needed a manager for all the contractors. And that's when I hired Lindsay, my director of operations. So, you know, that's how, that's how we learn, but it's like, everybody goes through this and it's like this process of like becoming the manager of these people. That was a learning curve. And then becoming more of like the leader who hires a manager to manage all the contractors um, it's, it's tough. It is a, it is a learning experience <laughs> for sure. Um, tip number eight is to take ownership of your part in every single relationship of somebody who works for you. I truly believe that like everything is not all good or all bad or everybody's not all right or all wrong. And for the most part, and I think that it's really important that we work on our own stuff and a lot of what I've seen in teams, like not, not just like in mine or not really even so much in mine, but as much as I've seen it with other people, friends, colleagues, is like people recreate their own like family issues or 
communication issues, like the structure of their family, their family dynamics within their company. Like they bring their own stuff and they like throw it on their team. And a lot of people make the mistake of treating their team like a family. Um, and I think that there's a way to create a really nice, like positive, warm, inviting culture without like the toxicity of being like, you're my family, you're my family. It's like, it's still work. We have to be respectful. We want to have boundaries um, and and be friends, but like, it's it's just different. And so a lot of, I think that's kind of important though, for you not like then putting all your shit onto them, to be honest. Um, and when anything has gone quote unquote wrong or someone's left or anything like that, I take full ownership for it. I'm like, that's on me. I see what I did wrong. I see I should have done this differently. I should have hired slower, fired faster, or I should have been clear on what I was hiring for, or I should have not hired for the person. I should have hired for the position. One of the tips that I've probably given you already, and I'm like, that's on me. And this person didn't do anything wrong because I didn't have the structure or the skills to deal with it and to know. Um, Because if it wasn't, if I had, then it wouldn't have ever gotten here, you know? So I take ownership, like the buck stops with me. Um, That's how I take, like, that's my position across the board in the company. Tip number nine is from one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, um, Jen Diaz. So I'll I'll link to her below, but Jen's my mindset coach. um, And Jen's just an incredible human. Highly recommend going and joining her Java method, by the way. Um, It's her membership. Her visualizations are incredible. And she's incredible. But Jen told me something really awesome that was actually, I think, from one of her clients um, in the past. And Jen, when I was struggling with some stuff related to team building over the last couple of years, she was like, you are responsible to them, not for them, right? So I am responsible to them, meaning I have to be a responsible leader. I have to be kind and like, you know, I have to be professional and like put together and do all these things. Um, and offer them a safe work environment and like all of those things, right? And I have to give them the tools that they need and access to resources and provide a lending ear and have an open door policy, which I always have. But I am not responsible for them, meaning that if I give feedback and someone doesn't love it, I am not responsible for their reaction. I'm responsible to deliver that feedback early and often, like I said. I'm responsible to do it in a kind, compassionate, respectful way. But I am not responsible if they have a freak out or I'm not responsible if someone quits because they don't want to hear feedback or, you know, whatever. I'm not responsible for that part. So learning that lesson over the last several years, and this goes back like years and years, I've I've like played this back now, this, this saying of you're responsible to them, but not for them now in my mind to relationships like for the last five years being like, oh yeah, I see how I was making myself responsible to them and for them uh, years ago, five years ago, you know? So it's something that I'm practicing right now. And I I actually think this is just like a really good tip for life, by the way, of like, I could see how this could really help with like family members, for friends, you know, whoever you have to like share feedback with or have any sort of relationship with. Last but not least, tip number 10, you know that I couldn't skip this one is that it is really, really helpful to start acting like a real company from the start, whether you have one employee, one contractor, your first VA, your first full-time employee, have legit contracts, like use an independent contractor agreement for any contractors that you hire. I have a really easy contract template for independent contractors you can uh, download and fill out in 15 minutes or less. So I will link to that below. It's in my template shop on my website, samvandermillen.com slash shop. Um, So you can check that out. You also, um, if you hire full-time employees, you want to explore having an employee handbook. That is not required, but an employee handbook has like company policies, company culture, holidays, how to request time off, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But as Kira says from uh, Paradigm HR, she always says, don't have an employee handbook if you're not going to follow it. So like if you're going to say all this stuff that you do or don't do and then not not do it, like forget it because you're not required to have it. Um, but if you do start hiring employees, then I recommend, you know, kind of get, getting started with those things. So, you know, getting that stuff in place, really acting like a real company. Once I was ready to hire full-time employees, I stepped up my game that I was like, okay, I want to offer them a 401k and I want to offer some like wellness perks and I want to have um, unlimited paid time off. And and then once I actually went on and hired my first full-time employee, Lindsay, 
I learned a lot about that process. And I'm a lawyer and this was shocking to me, but like there was an insane amount of paperwork and like setting up on payroll and all that good stuff. And then um, like you have to get certain insurances once you have full-time employees and, you know, it's a whole thing. So I highly recommend, I worked with Paradigm HR, I'll link to them below, but I highly recommend working with a professional once you get to that level of like wanting to hire a full-time employee because it, it, it was a lot. And it's like, I could see it derailing your business, especially if you have a business where you have a lot of client work to do, it would be pretty tough. So those are my 10 tips on, you know, what I've learned so far from contractor and employee breakups. Um, like I said, I would kind of hope that it's like um, romantic breakups where you don't have like super bad beef with anyone. But um, I have no idea how people <laughs> feel about me and I'm not, I can't control that. But like, I I take ownership either way. If anyone ever talked to me about it, I'd be like, yeah, totally. I own that. Like, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's like, you did everything wrong and I'm the victim. Like I can, I can really just sit in my own, like, and own my part of it. Um, and hope that I just get better and, and learn. Um, so I hope that some of these were helpful to you. I will, um, link below to that episode 64 on hiring contractors. Cause in that I break down the difference between contractors and employees. Um, and I'll link to everything else that we've talked to, uh, talked about in today's episode. If you like hearing about these kinds of tips, if you want to get weekly legal tips in your inbox, or you want to learn my marketing secrets for building a multi seven figure business, um, all the behind the scenes juicy stuff, make sure you click the easy email list sign up um, below that. That will just automatically sign you up to receive my emails without going through any sort of marketing funnel. So it's a great way to start receiving my emails, hear about what's coming up, get special offers, um, but really just hear my kind of like most vulnerable behind the scenes advice on what it's really like to build this kind of business. Um, the best thing for you to do is to sign up for my easy emails below. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. Send me a DM on Instagram at Sam Vanny Whelan. Let me know if you liked it, what came up for you. Let me know like what was the number one thing you learned from this episode. I would love to know that. And if this episode was helpful for you and you think it would be great for somebody else, text it to a friend, leave a quick review or a rating wherever you listen. I just so appreciate you doing, taking one small step today. If you could just do one thing, whether it's to send it to somebody, leave a rating or review, send me a DM about it. If you could do one small thing um, to help move this podcast forward and get it into the hands of other online business owners, I would be immensely appreciative. So thank you so much. And I will chat with you next week. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Terms podcast. Make sure to follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. You can also check out all of our podcast episodes, show notes, links, and more at samvanderwhelan.com slash podcast. You can learn more about legally protecting your business and take my free legal workshop, Five Steps to Legally Protect and Grow Your Online Business at samvanderwhelan.com. And to stay connected and follow along, follow me on Instagram at samvanderwhelan and send me a DM to say hi. Just remember that although I am a attorney, I am not your attorney and I am not offering you legal advice in today's episode. This episode and all of my episodes are informational and educational only. It is not a substitute for seeking out your own advice from your own lawyer. And please keep in mind that I can't offer you legal advice. I don't ever offer any legal services, but I think I offer some pretty good information.